Well, Donald Trump has been consistently right about exactly one thing in his life. Donald Trump always knows. He always knows when he's going to be indicted and arrested. And his latest probably accurate prediction is any day now. At 12.39 p.m. today, in a mass email solicitation of money to give Donald Trump money, quote, to save America during this darkest hour, end quote. Donald Trump's first words in that email were, any day now. The first line of Donald Trump's email today, asking people for money, said, any day now, the Department of Justice may indict and arrest me once again. You've got to give him credit for never having been wrong about that. He got the timing wrong on his first arrest and indictment, but only by a week or so. Former federal prosecutor Andrew Weissman, who has also been remarkably accurate in his predictions about timing for Trump indictments, has calculated, based on public information, where Special Prosecutor Jack Smith is in checking the necessary prosecutorial boxes before an indictment. And Andrew Weissman predicts, quote, Jack Smith will seek the indictment tomorrow or Thursday at the latest in D.C., I may be the only frequent texter in the country who has never typed the letters LOL. I prefer a more custom-made declaration of amusement, but Donald Trump's harried last White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, was understandably an LOL guy. He didn't have the time to specify how funny he thought whatever you just texted him was. In December of 2020, more than a month after Donald Trump lost the presidential election, Mark Meadows knew that the claims Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani were making about dead people voting were lies. They were, to Mark Meadows, laughable lies. They were lies that deserved an LOL and got one from Mark Meadows, an LOL that could send Mark Meadows to prison convicted of crimes if he has not already reached a cooperation agreement with Special Prosecutor Jack Smith to avoid a prison sentence. The highly incriminating Mark Meadows LOL comes at the end of a text exchange Mark Meadows had with Deputy White House Counsel Eric Hirschman. In a text exchange obtained by the January 6th Committee and handed over to Special Prosecutor Jack Smith, Eric Hirschman said, Just an FYI, Alex Cannon and his team verified that the 10,000 plus supposed dead people voting in Georgia is not accurate. Meadows, I didn't hear that claim. It is not accurate. I think I found 22, if I remember correctly. Two of them died just days before the general. Hirschman, it was alleged in Rudy's hearing today. Your number is much closer to what we can prove I think it's 12. Meadows, my son found 12 obituaries and six other possible, depending on the voter roll accuracy. Hirschman, that sounds more like it. Maybe he can help Rudy find the other 10,000. Meadows, L-O-L. That is proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Mark Meadows knew that every word Rudolph Giuliani and Donald Trump said about dead voters was a laughable lie. But Mark Meadows supported, enabled, and conspired to help advance those election lies, as that LOL proves beyond a reasonable doubt. The Washington Post is now reporting that the relationship between Mark Meadows and Donald Trump has, quote, soured. Trump has repeatedly complained to others about Meadows and questioned his loyalty, according to three Trump advisors, since Trump said he was named a target of Smith's investigation earlier last week. His allies have been feverishly speculating about the degree of Meadows' cooperation with the Smith probe and whether he has provided testimony that Smith will use to build a case against Trump or others. In the weeks after the 2020 election, Mark Meadows reportedly pandered to Donald Trump's lies about election fraud. 
The Washington Post reports, quote, people close to Meadows have said that he was privately sympathetic to those Trump advisors who were skeptical of the fraud claims. Yet Meadows also played both sides, often appearing to indulge Trump's desire to use those false allegations to try to remain in office. People who witnessed his behavior have said another possible cooperator and potential plea deal beneficiary in Jack Smith's January 6th investigation is Bernie Carrick, the only former New York police commissioner who has ever been convicted of crimes and imprisoned. Carrick served time in federal prison for financial crimes committed while he was New York City's police commissioner, and he obviously does not want to return to prison. He was at Rudolph Giuliani's side for all of Giuliani's public lying about the election leading up to and on January 6th. Bernie Carrick and his criminal defense lawyer have now turned over thousands of pages of records to Jack Smith and investigators related to his and Rudolph Giuliani's and Donald Trump's lies about election fraud. Bernie Carrick's criminal defense lawyer in the investigation is Tim Palatore, who resigned in April as a member of the Trump criminal defense team. Attorney Parlatore, in a statement to NBC News, said, I have shared all of these documents, approximately 600 megabytes, mostly PDFs, with the special counsel and look forward to sitting down with them in about two weeks to discuss. Today, a Russian drone attack came closer to hitting a NATO country than any previous Russian attack. The drone attack occurred in the Ukrainian town of Reni, which is just across the Danube River from Romania, which is a member of NATO. The New York Times reports Ukrainian officials and Romania's president blamed the attack on Russia, which has spent the past week bombarding Ukrainian ports near the city of Odessa after pulling out of a deal that enabled Ukraine to ship its grain across the Black Sea, Russia justifies all of its attacks on Ukraine by delivering to the Russian people an uninterrupted stream of propaganda on Russian television. Our next guest spent five days virtually locked in a room with that propaganda in constant monitoring of Russian TV for an article in The Atlantic titled, I watched Russian television for five days straight, my full immersion in Putin's propaganda. Gary Steingart did not just watch news programs. He watched everything on Russian television, including what we would call reality shows. The reality of Russian life depicted on those shows is grim, with women being threatened and mistreated by drunken husbands and boyfriends. Quote, a well-trod Russian TV theme, Provincials in Distress, are interviewed by stylish urban hosts as if they are Chekhovian peasants being judged before the district court in czarist times. Subconsciously, shows like these teach poorer and older Russians, the kind of people who regularly watch state television, that they should be ashamed before their betters and that they cannot expect much from life or their immediate families. The anti-impotence potion advertised on Russian TV is called the Emperor's Secret, which the ads assure the drunken husbands from the reality shows, quote, can be mixed with alcohol. After watching five days of Russian television, Gary Steingart saw, saw Russia's war against Ukraine most accurately represented in Russian television by, actually, the typical drunken, abusive man in the reality shows. Russia is the spurned lover with the very aggressive nature, taking out his inhumanity on the innocent neighbor next door, despite all the posturing and doublespeak Russian television announces as much to the world. Whether on the airwaves or perhaps someday at The Hague, the evidence has been clearly presented. Joining us now is New York Times bestselling author Gary Steingart. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, this this uh, reading about, the, as I did about Russian television, is much more than I've ever come to understand. 
by our occasional coverage of what they show on so-called news programs and the, the talk shows there, our audiences have some familiarity with that. It's the other programming where the propaganda is so fascinatingly Im embedded. Uh, was that a surprise to you? Yes, it was actually interesting to see that Russian propaganda exists in almost every single part of state television, not just the news. It's a full stop package. So, for example, you have a show where a doctor is talking about foods that help with your cardiovascular health. And he'll just happen to mention that the best onion to eat is red onion from Crimea, meaning Russian-occupied Crimea, the, the part of Ukraine that they took over in 2014. So everything has a double meaning, and everything is there to remind the viewer, uh, whether it's reality TV or a health show or even a show where uh, young people are dancing, there's troops of young dancers. Those young dancers are also from a, a region that Russia has taken over. So you're constantly being reminded of sort of Russia's greatness and the importance of this war. Did you, um, did, did you have any understanding of what it means to be bombarded with this nonstop and in terms of the credibility of the material? I mean, for, for, for you, it was incredible, uh, but you have other sources of information. Well, I think what's interesting is that a lot of Russians who watch state television day in, day out are older Russians. Uh, a lot of the very younger Russians get their news more from the Internet, which is one reason why Putin is now thinking of ways to, to cut off the Internet in Russia, or at least to censor it the way it's being censored in countries like China. Uh, but older people, and Russia is a very old country. It's demographically, it is not, uh, not a lot of Russians are having kids, you know. Uh, but demographically, a lot of older Russians or even middle-aged Russians uh, live and die by Russian state television. So after my article came out, I would get all these emails from Russians in America. These are people who watch Russian state television in America and who have uh, mothers or mother-in-laws or father-in-laws. And they say, even here in America, they watch this nonstop and have a completely biased view of the world. So this isn't even just happening back in Russia. This is happening among the diaspora of Russians. So you're, you and your family left Russia when you were about eight years old. Did you find yourself, uh, when you were immersed in this television, wondering about what your life would be there today if you hadn't left? <laughs> Well, I am very certain that uh, if I hadn't left Russia earlier, I would have left, as many young men especially did, and I'm not a young man, but right now they're getting people in their 60s to join the Russian army. They're really desperate for anybody to fight. So I think right now, and having a, a son, I would be probably fleeing to Turkey or Armenia or Georgia or many of the other places where uh, Russians of uh, Russian men especially find themselves, but also anyone who, fight, who feels that Russia is not going to be successful in the next 10, 20, 30, infinity amount of years. What does it say about uh, the insecurity of the regime? Uh, the, the, what does this propaganda ultimately communicate about the insecurity of the regime? There's, I think, a very kind of there's both a feeling of superiority matched with a feeling of inferiority in a lot of Russian television. There's a superiority of saying we are the strongest, we have the best culture, we're far better than Western culture, we're certainly far better than Ukrainian culture, which is why we can commit genocidal acts against them. But at the same time, a feeling of inferiority. There's constant, uh, you know, Anthony Blinken is on all the time, and, and it's it's feeling of, why don't they like us? Gosh, all we're trying to do is, you know, invade another country. Why can't they love us the way they should, given how superior we are? So there's this endless cycle of superiority and inferiority that I think really extends to Russia's uh, way of dealing with the world for centuries, not just after Putin or during the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, the feeling... Go, uh, you report that the apparently the most popular Americans on Russian television are Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson. Well, the case of Donald Trump, Donald Trump, and you were talking about him in the previous segment, the many trials that the Donald is going to have to face in the next year or two or who knows how long. That is really one of the biggest things that Russian television, hence the Kremlin, is worried about. Because the feeling is that if Trump comes back, then we have a chance in winning against Ukraine. 
because he may hold back on armaments. He may, I mean, there's, you know, as the leader of the free world and certainly as, as one of the chiefs of NATO, uh, he is the person that can really help Ukraine win the war. And without him, we really have a chance. And Tucker, and I, I haven't seen Russian television since Tucker's demise from Fox, but I mean, you would see Tucker all the time. I was surprised they didn't just give him the whole hour, of, you know, translate, translated into Russian. That, that would have been easier because you would just you would get snippets of him throughout the day on each of the three main Russian channels. He was their best friend. Gary Steingart, thank you very much for doing what uh, we couldn't do. Thank you very much. <laughs>